Okay, hello ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and get rolling here. Uh, so a question was posed to me, uh, how do I take really good Cornell notes um, for this class? And so it's a fair question because Cornell notes are a fairly new thing for our district, uh, especially our school, and especially for math, like taking really good notes may not be the easiest thing. So um, in an effort to kill a couple birds on stone, I want to talk about uh, generalizing Pythagorean theorem, but also want to show you what I think really good notes should look like. Um, so a couple things to note right off the bat um, is uh, that you don't have to make your notes look exactly like my notes. The point of notes is to make them very personal. And so when I was going through and thinking about like what we need to talk about in terms of generalized Pythagorean theorem, these are the questions I came up with. The other thing to note is this. This should not be the first time you're taking these notes. So coronal notes should be regarded as kind of an end process. And so the beginning process of like engaging stuff in class, taking the notes in class very quickly, and then once you have a good handle on stuff, then transferring them to coronal notes. That's how you maximize their effectiveness. Um, well, come Monday, I'm going to introduce a metacognition sheet to you guys, which is a way to take those notes during class quickly and effectively. And so after processing and engaging with the notes, and then moving to Pythagorean, or I'm sorry, to coronal format, um, is going to maximize its uh, your retention and ultimately the notes usefulness because again notes aren't useful unless you can remember them um, but anyway let's go and get started uh things to keep in mind before we do begin though since this is a video feel free to pause at any time make sure that you have everything together and if there are uh, questions existing past these notes please make sure you're asking them either to me directly email schoology or of course our parking lot those are all ways i've made available to get questions to me if you need them um, so let's talk about generalizing the Pythagorean theorem. The essential question I'm going to work on, uh, we should be working on right now, is how do you generalize the Pythagorean theorem, but actually much more importantly, why is it useful to do so? Um, so the very first question I think we should ask ourselves is what does it actually mean to generalize? Now this isn't the first question I asked you in class, but again, these notes should be taken as an end result, uh, not the beginning result or beginning encounter. So um, let's talk about generalization first. I have it pre-written here because I didn't want to take time to write it out while I'm trying to talk. Um, so generalization is actually the most massive idea in mathematics, period. Um, if you don't get what generalization is about, you simply have not learned math. And so uh, if you never explicitly thought about it, here's a perfect time to start because generalization is really used for five things. Uh, one is to take this idea, re this really specific mathematical idea, in this case, the Pythagorean theorem, which is introduced to you very early on. It's a simple idea uh, but, and very, very specific in its application in that form and make it useful in more situations. Now we've seen that in class, um, that taking the Pythagorean theorem, generalizing it all of a sudden creates this wonderful formula for us that we can apply to things that the Pythagorean theorem simply could not handle. Um, you can be usable with different inputs. Now what I mean with that, and we'll see here in a moment, um, is that if you had a Pythagorean theorem, it requires an A, B, and C, but if we generalize it, then it can start accepting, say, coordinate pairs. And so different inputs, very important in the idea of generalization. A tool for more complex problem solving. This is really the core of the idea. You take an idea that's only useful in a couple situations and turn it into this nice, general, wonderfully applicable tool you can use all the time. Um, sometimes you can extract a reusable formula. Um, the distance formula is that. And so sometimes the, the first three things are really just in a formula. Um, and as we move forward in the year, extracting patterns will become bigger for us too. Um, so uh, the next question I think that we should encounter uh, what makes Pythagorean theorem restrictive? Why should it be generalized? Okay, so let's kind of talk through this. Let me, let me offer a few uh, notes to go along with that. Um, so if you think about the Pythagorean theorem, uh, which we, of course we know as a squared plus b squared equals c squared, uh, the, if you think about the inputs of this, a, b, and c are side lengths. Or another way to look at that, distances. Um, so the implication here is that if you're using the Pythagorean theorem, it, it needs A, B, and or C to operate, which means you already have to have predetermined distances to make this useful. And so the restrictive part of this is that you actually need distances. And so distances aren't actually very easy to come by. Like that's actually a weird thing in, in math to say, well, the distance of this is just five. Like that's weird. It's not very um, universal. And so when you're using the Pythagorean theorem, that's a big, that's a big restriction is that requires side lengths. Um, so the question of why should it be generalized, well, it's kind of the opposite of that. A generalization would allow for different inputs, uh, namely something more common in math, coordinate pairs. Um, so let's go ahead and capture that. So 
So uh, the restriction is that in these side lengths, the generalization is going to be useful because, again, we can find this distance, um, but we're going to be using coordinate pairs to do it as opposed to directly side lengths. Um, so if we drop down here and we think about how do you generalize Pythagorean theorem, well, you have to kind of accept um, up here, like this A, B, and C represent three side lengths of, of course, a right triangle, uh, where you have A to be one side, B to be the other leg, and then C, of course, occurs um, as this hypotenuse. And so typically what you're going to find is this length. Now, finding A, finding B, especially with quarter pairs, is not a tough task. They're vertical and horizontal lines. Um, but if you're talking about finding the hypotenuse, um, this is a general representation for any diagonal distance. Um, which again is the, part of the reason why we should generalize this thing is because if we could, that means we can find any distance except not just horizontal or vertical ones, but really oriented in any possible way, any diagonal. And so we can mimic that here in terms of like how to actually generalize the statement, or I'm sorry, the theorem. Um, but what we're going to do is actually pick a couple points. Um, so we're going to call that, um, let's call just point one and call this guy point two. Okay, that's weird. Okay, let's just get rid of this. Okay, um, so in terms of generalizing it, um, let's just pick a couple points to represent that for, or for, I'm sorry, diagonal distance. Um, call that point one, call this guy point two. Um, now, we're going to try to find this distance using Pythagorean theorem, which means we can try to recall like that nice right triangle. Um, although that's not really the focus since we're trying to generalize it. Um, so, in terms of generalizing, the idea is that it does apply to more cases, so we're not going to use numbers. Using numbers makes it a specific case, but if we use, let's say, variably defined points, um, that means it's going to be applicable for anything the points could take. Um, in other words, all real numbers. And so if we take this point here and say we call it x1, comma y1, um, that can stand for any x and y number that we can possibly want. Down here, this can be x2, comma y2. Um, again, any point that we want. Now, uh, we found in class it's useful to also call this point something, um, but given like this is on the same vertical line, we can call it x1, and this is on the same horizontal line as point 2, we can call this y2. Um, in the process of generalization, you never want to introduce more variables than you actually need. What you want to do is try to restrict it to the variables already used, and then only if needed, bring in more variables at the end. Um, so to use Pythagorean theorem, we do still need to kind of think in terms of a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, but we have to be a little more clever in how we find a, b, and c. Um, so let's say we want to find this a value, which we designated to be like this diagonal. We have to think about how we actually calculate that diagonal. Often the process of generalization is thinking about the general calculation. Um, so if you think in general how to find a distance a, we of course could count, but we can also do it by subtraction problem. Um, since we're traversing just straight up and down, we're looking actually for a y difference. And so we can say this is just a change in y, which delta y does take care of that or more specifically the subtraction problem like y1 minus y2. Um, we use absolute values to ensure the distance is going to be positive. Um, so that gives us our a value. So we can transfer this here. So a squared, we can say is just its overall change in y, which is specifically calculated as y1 minus y2. Again, recall the delta y here, this guy right here. That delta just means change in, hence in this case change in y, because we're talking vertical. All right, uh, so if we don't want this b for this b squared, we're talking about this horizontal change. And this, of course, is just going to be the change in x because we're talking left, right. The calculation, of course, will be x1 minus x2, uh, in absolute value to ensure positivity. After all, this is a distance. Um, so we can say we're adding this to the change in x, uh, which will just be uh, x1 minus x2. Uh, now, we do have to do a little cleanup here because, of course, this is squared. So this uh, delta y squared, delta x squared, square that, square that. And that should be equal to my c squared. Okay. Um, now, we've accomplished what we said we want to accomplish in terms of generalization. Um, if you recall at the beginning of the notes, let me scroll back up. Um, generalization 
generally are um, occur when they we we now make them useful more situations, which we did because well we can now find any diagonal distance with this formula. Um, we can use with different inputs, which we're doing because we can now accept coordinate values. Um, it's a tool for more complex problem solving, which we're going to see later. Um, and in the end, we actually do have a reusable formula. Now, in terms of cleanup, we can do a little something here. Um, typically, you put the x's first. And, and, and since we have an absolute value that we're also going to square, we can actually change this to parentheses because a squared number must be positive. Um, so our final distance formula will be x1 minus x2 squared. Um, plus y1 minus y2 squared equals c squared. Um, now, if you look this formula up, you actually might see it uh, with the square root already taken. But of course, you know if you want to solve that square, you're going to have to take a square root. Um, so we can also look at it in terms of this. And sometimes you see a c um, replaced with a d for distance. Okay. Now this is of course a distance formula. Um, now the actual calculation of x1s and x2s, um, you can alternatively also think of this in terms of the deltas, which sometimes is a little bit more useful, especially cognitively just trying to deal with it, all the subtraction going on. And so we can think of this in terms of like uh, delta x squared plus delta y squared equals the distance, which I'll mark as d. And so this is also an acceptable way to think about the distance formula. Um, the delta y and the delta x, again, are just that subtraction. Um, so that's the actual generalization to the distance formula. Now let's look at uh, some situations um, where this is actually applicable. Um, I think the most one is when you have a problem with a type where you just want to find the distance between two points. Um, like that's the most direct application of the distance formula. And so like, for example, if I just say I want you to find the distance Uh, between the points, I don't know, 1, 4 and 6, 12. Okay? Um, we can use either form the distance formula we want. Um, I prefer actually the second one uh, because we're just talking about overall distance. So if we use the distance formula as a square root of delta x squared uh, plus delta y squared, we can actually do that just kind of as we go. So delta x is the difference between 1 and 6, which is a 5. Um, so that would just be 5 squared. And delta y is distance between 4 and 12, um, which would be 8, so we'll call it 8 squared. Um, again, we're just using Pythagorean theorem, generalized now to points. Um, so if we continue this, we have what 25 plus 64, um, which is the square root of this is an 89. Um, we're not worried about shortening that or trying to simplify it at that point. We're just trying to get some examples. Um, so there's certainly one example there. Uh, let's do another one. Um, let's say I want to find the distance between uh, let's throw some negatives in there. Negative 2 comma negative 8 and uh, 1 comma negative 7. Okay, uh, so Let's use the long form of distance for this one, just so we can get a nice example in here. And so distance is defined to be the difference between x1 minus x2 squared up. That finds your a distance. Uh, this will be your y1 minus y2. That will be your like b distance. And so we can now substitute specific values. Um, x1 minus x2 would be negative 2 minus 1. Uh, so plugging those into the formula, we have negative 2, subtraction from the formula itself and then 1 squared up. And now to take care of the y's, that will be negative 8. Um, subtract off from the formula, and then a negative 7. So we do actually have two negatives here. One carries from the formula, one carries from the value of y2. Um, so simplifying it further, negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3, and we'll square that in a moment. Um, this two negatives become a positive, so that's negative 8 plus 7. That's negative 1 squared up. Okay, uh, so squared values will stay positive. That's why we're able to drop the absolute value beforehand. Um, so 3 squared will be 9, one, negative 1 squared will be 1. So this is actually just a square root of 10. Okay, so again, the distance formula when generalized 
I'm um, oh, sorry, excuse me, the Pythagorean theorem is not super useful in its original form. Um, it requires distances for inputs, um, but it will actually give you a distance, which is what is useful about it. Um, a generalized form would allow the inputs of coordinate pairs, which is a much more common thing to have in terms of like uh, rigorous algebraic studies. And so if we can generalize the Pythagorean theorem, we're able to find the C distance, any diagonal distance, any point in time. So the way we generalize is really just to think about the general calculation of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so we define two points of the triangle to be generally x1 and x2, which means we can really in the end substitute all numbers for it. If you think back to geometry, this is the point of proof. Proof allows you to solve one thing in general and make that idea apply to all things. So if I solve this for x1, y1, x2, y2, it allows me then to say this is true for any numbers for x1, y1, x2, y2. That's a true generalization. Um, we did a calculation here, uh, a delta y, which is the vertical change, is just y1 minus y2. Um, delta x, which is the horizontal change, x1 minus x2. Um, in absolute values, of course, to preserve uh, positive distance. But once we actually start calculating the general Pythagorean theorem, we can quickly drop those absolute values because we're squaring, and that accomplishes the same end goal of absolute values, which is to make things positive. And so we end up really with two versions of the distance formula. Um, the top one here in black, which is the full calculation um, with the points actually listed out. The second one acknowledges we just want distances. So we shortcut that to delta y delta x. So some quick examples of where this is gonna be useful. Um, we have really just finding distances between points. Um, it can be disguised in a very clever way, but in the end, that's what the distance formula does. It finds you distances between two designated points. Um, so we have a couple examples here as well. Now, to finish these notes out, and of course you can add more if you want, this is just my suggestion for notes. Um, notes are personal, so you should definitely take time to add things or subtract things as you see fit. The most important part though, aside from everything else, uh, you know, the note body, um, is to answer your essential question and to do that in the conclusion. And so I'm gonna offer this very easy one, two, three step amazing conclusion writing technique, um, which is to do this. One, you should first reread your notes. If you notice, before I dropped down to the conclusion, I went back to the top and I started reading everything again. Um, this is not just for me being a teacher, it's for you, the student, uh, but I'm actually trying to, to model what it means to reread the notes. Go back through the whole thing, ask yourself if it makes sense to you. Um, you should always reread your notes about every 10 or so minutes uh, during the class process, and I'm gonna start giving you explicit time to do that. The next thing you should do is to highlight or underline three key words or phrases, um, and that should be in relationship to the essential question. And so if you revisit the essential question, how do you generalize the Pythagorean theorem and why is it useful? Um, you should challenge yourself to go through and try to highlight or underline line five big things. Um, now, the notes here aren't very extensive, but if the notes are more extensive, it'll obviously be more challenging. Now the last step, and this is a part that uh, most people skip, but you shouldn't because it's one of the most important parts of call notes and what really makes them work, you need to try to force yourself to use the things you underline to answer the essential question. Um, now for these, I don't think it'd be super tough, but this is something we're gonna explore moving forward. Okay, um, so that's what I think good Cornell notes should look like. Um, if you had these notes going into the test, I think this would be quite useful for you. Um, now there's lots of things that I was generalizing, um, not to pick the same word or pun in my head, and so this is an opportunity to, to again go through and personalize your notes. Um, so go through the discussion again, add things that maybe I didn't write, things that you know are gonna be useful to you, okay? Um, so that's all I got for this one. Uh, I'll see you again in a moment because I'm going to talk about the equation of a circle.